everyone likes a hobby, something they can focus on to extend their knowledge, their skills, and community. There's a whole world of diversity out there. There's painting, collecting, the list is endless. But the one that I think has a great importance in society is a hobby that not many people are familiar with. It is called reenacting, a word that most probably would be familiar with, but they cannot truly define. I'm here to bring out reenacting and living history into the light. I will be defining this hobby and I will show you the journey we take. Reenacting. What does it mean? Well, I'll start with the literal term. It's a combination of two different words that are somewhat related, actually. Reenactment, which is simply a historical event that is acted out for entertainment and education, and the word acting. This word creates a new hobby that perfectly describes, well, reenacting. You go out into fields and open areas all set up to look like a battlefield, and uh, you act on it. There are a few stories around that well, the reenactment can date back to the eras that are being reenacted themselves. Stories of children back in both world wars that were reenacting the war with uh, tin pot hats and wooden rifles, all just dressed up for play and fun. It's more developed now for sure. Nowadays, it's more about education. It's also worth noting that there are eras in reenacting. They are like genres to us. <clears throat> The earliest types are medieval, where you see fighting with swords, bows and arrows, and shields. After that, you can see uh, Revolutionary War or Pre-Revolutionary War reenactments. Sometimes they're actually performed on the grounds where the actual event happened, such as the Boston Massacre. Then, more famously, there's American Civil War reenactments. That one attracts thousands of reenactors each year, you can find them just all dotted across the US. and uh, or a blast to watch, I can tell you that. After that, you can find me. I've taken a dedication to the Great War, or commonly referred to as World War I. Well then, uh, after that, you have probably the most popular of all reenacting is World War II. You can find World War II reenactments all across the world, uh, North America, Europe, uh, Africa, it's just, it is very, very common. It spans across several different battles, several different time zones, you know, just, it's massive. After World War II, you can find some of the lesser known reenactments, which can include Korean War, Vietnam War, uh, Desert Storm even. But in this video, I will be focusing on my historical field, which is the Great War, because I have the most experience with that field. <clears throat> and that's all just reenacting. The other part of this hobby is slightly different. It's called Living History. These are not done out on fields and dugouts. Well, Sometimes they are, but uh, they don't really do anything. These are called static events, meaning they don't move. They uh, basically are just displays that have a bunch of tables set up, military items, civilian items, paraphernalia, all just put out for display. You can have tents, pup tents, uh, mannequins even. And, uh, you know, it's not really as fun, but it's a lot more educational. You're putting information out for the public eye to see. And your job is to stand there and basically answer questions that anyone has about certain items, what you do, or just the generic uh, idea of it all. So now I've got these two event types explained, and now I'll answer the why. Why do we do this? What's our purpose reenacting living history? Well, my best answer to this is to respect and acknowledge. Us reenactors, we portray people of the past by dressing in their clothes, their gear. We are literally putting ourselves in their shoes. We do this so we cannot forget their past. History creates who we are and why we're here. These people in the past also suffered with all the war, the disease, the politics. It continues to this day. We bring the past to life as a lesson that we can all learn from. As a reminder that a whole generation long ago was fighting for our country, possibly your freedom, and we want to respect them. We want you to respect them, and to understand them, just lest we forget. With that settled, I highly encourage my fellow friends and acquaintances to take this journey. And I can say with confidence that you can too. With enough time and savvy spending, you can be a top-notch pro. So to get started with this journey, you must find a historical interest of yours. Do you like a certain era? Have you taken interest in a certain war or peace time? If you have, build off from there. This is your seed to plant. 
Next step is to find a group. Whether it's local or distanced, you will meet people that are glad to help you with your impression. Your impression is just a name for your uniform, gear, and other collectibles all combined. Soon enough, this group will guide you to the proper sites to purchase from, the tips on improving your impression, and techniques to use when looking at buying items, say, in person. They will also give you advice on avoiding certain areas, such as scam sites, false vendors, and incorrect details. They will mainly enforce the last one right there, incorrect details. This is guaranteed to label you as a, hear me out, farb. Farb. F-A-R-B. I don't know what that word came from, where it came from. It's just, it's just a word we use to describe someone who has a historically inaccurate impression, or just in an accurate part. It's often easy to avoid being called a farb, uh, but try your best anyways to avoid incorrect detail. With all that settled, your group will feel like a family the more time you spend with them. The next step after finding a group is uh, purchasing the starting items for your impression, which I've been told should be done from the ground up. Start with footwear, like uh, boots, then build up from there. You'll find yourself buying from places you never thought existed. You'll find yourself collecting clothing that doesn't follow the modern norm. Not by a long shot. Now, when you're building up your impression, it's worth noting the differences between reproductions and originals. I'm saying this basically. You can buy items for your impression reproductions that are brand new, designed from original blueprints, and built with modern machinery, perhaps. If it fits the requirements, and uh, most of the time, they're near exact original items. This, is got, this example right here is a German Brotbüttel. It means bread bag in English. So this is uh, built by a Polish company, and it's basically just a near-exact replica of a German bread bag. A soldier would be holding their rations, personal items, and kit, maybe even a bar of chocolate if he so decides. Yep, that's the reproduction. And then there are originals. To explain originals, well, why need them? Well, if you're having a certain impression being built up, and there are a few items that you just need but you just cannot find anywhere that are reproduced, that is when you reach for an original. My perfect example right here is this, the M16 Stahlhelm, steel helmet model of 1916 in English. This is original, built in Germany, 1916. It was built for the war, for World War I. It was probably one of the best helmet designs there was of the entire war. Yep, original steel, built by the E.T. Company, which is a short for um, a really long German word I don't want to pronounce right now. It has a reproduction leather liner on the inside, and my German name, which is Emmett Seidel, and infantry number, Tom 23. I'm part of the 23rd Infantry Regiment, von Winterfeld. So yeah, certain original items that you just need because there aren't reproductions elsewhere. Why'd I get an original helmet that could probably be dented or something? It's just, reproduction helmets are awful. They're just awful. The bill can be too long on some of them, or Maybe the chin strap lug can be placed a bit too high, making it an Austrian style of look. The details are minuscule that make it incorrect, but they are there, and they will ruin your impression when you meet other reenactors that are experienced. Trust me, and I know from experience. As for other original items, it may not just be the helmet, like uh, this canteen cup. I think it's original. Eh, probably not, but. I think a better example would probably be a rifle. This is an American Model 1917 uh, Enfield, made by Remington in July of 1918. In that time frame, this could have been issued to the front. And you see, there's a wood repair on the side that indicates it was probably hit by something. There are no reproduction rifles out there. You have to get originals if you want the rifles. But when you do find them, it is definitely worth it. But do take notice, this is also a time-consuming hobby. You may not have the money to really do this, but with enough time, you definitely could. You see, uh, when I first started out, I only had this helmet. This Brody helmet model 1917. Reproduction, and I bought it for like $70. Seems like a lot, but it's cheaper compared to original. I started out with just that and a trench whistle. After that, I got the shirt, uh, a pair of incorrect pants that I sold later, a uh, canteen cover, uh, then after that it was the haversack, uh, cartridge belt, and it just grew from there. I had no real job at the time, actually. It was all basically birthday and Christmas money, and uh, 
the summer in 2019, I had myself an official job at Geiger Boatworks, and that helped me buy the rifle. You see, over time, your impression will build up and up. There's still a lot to go through if you want, like, a really detailed, researched impression. And that's another thing. Do your research. Stick, just listen to your group. Do your research about what impression you're going to be doing exactly. I cannot stress this enough. Lacking research means uh, money wasted and time wasted. So, um, remember, it may look intimidating, uh, but with patience and savvy spending, the sky is the limit. And I think it really extends the hobby for the better. So now, you think you're ready for events now, huh? You've taken the time to build up a decent, maybe a near-perfect impression, and now you want to take the next big stride forward. Your group will likely display events on, uh, say, a Facebook page or maybe a website. For me, it's on Facebook under the Events tab. Once you know how many events uh, you are participating in, you better prepare. This is the next big step. What does that look like for me? Well, first I plan out what I'm bringing, uh, whether it's items, food, weaponry, clothing. Usually days, maybe just one, I pack my kit. What does packing my kit look like for me exactly? Well, um, it basically means I'm getting period correct rations like corned beef, hardtack, and uh, I'm putting blank rounds in my ammunition pouch, and I'm washing my uniform. And now, I'll give you a little packing demonstration. Pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and smile, smile, smile. While you below the put the light your bag, smile, boys, and smile, smile. What's the use of worrying? It never was worthwhile. So, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag and Always prepare for events. You do not want to rely on other soldiers' rations to get by. You do not want to sleep cold on the ground with no blanket or any clothing, and you do not want to look unprepared for displays. Preparation is key. And uh, as you should, figure out how you're going to get to these events, because uh, if you can't drive, well, uh, you have a little problem there, as I have experienced myself. So now you're at your first event. You are now settling in. There are a few tips to learn before attending events, especially with reenactments. Remember firstly, you are acting as if it is a show. Make your presence as real as can be, especially during the battle itself. This means you should keep your head down as if you are really dodging bullets. You know, follow orders from officers, NCOs, and sergeants, and most importantly, call your shots. During reenactments, uh, none of the participants know when they get uh, shot. The guns there all fire planks, meaning only they uh, make a realistic bang, a muzzle flash, maybe a bit of smoke, and that's it. Reenactors don't know when they get hit, so uh, for the realism of the battle, make it look like you got hit. Say, uh, if you run out into the open where the machine gun fire is out there to get you, make it look like you get hit by the machine gun fire. Fall onto the ground in pain and agony. It may sound morbid, but that's the reality, and you want to represent the reality. And maybe your sergeant, before going over the top, will order you specifically to get hit over the top for the show. See, it's all just a big show. Just make it look real. Make it look convincing as can be. This can also sharpen your acting skills if you so choose to. And that's what reenactments all are all about. With that in mind, I can only say now, Enjoy the time being. Immerse yourself in the moment. Converse with the others around you. Feel the rush. You are in that time period. The modern world isn't anywhere to be seen. You are in that time. And remember, this is only a hobby. 